I want you to imagine that you're an astronaut floating outside of the International Space Station. You need to move from one section to another, but there's no air to push against. There's no ground to walk on, and there's no other forces pulling you or pushing you, just empty space. So, how do you move? The answer lies in Newton's famous third law of motion. If you push on something, it pushes back on you with an equal and opposite force. If you throw a small tool in one direction, you'll start moving in the opposite direction. But the question is, how fast will you begin moving if you do that? How much force do you need to reach your destination? Believe it or not, answering these kinds of questions actually starts with solving equations. Many people ask me, what are equations actually used for? Well, today I'd like to give you many examples where simple equations are used to solve real problems, and then we'll dive in and talk about how to actually solve them. First up is electric circuits. If you know the voltage of a battery and the resistance of a wire or a component, how much electric current actually flows in the circuit? Ohm's law is a famous law with a simple equation but a fundamental principle of electricity. It's just a basic algebraic equation. You might see it as V equals IR or you can rearrange it to I equals V over R using algebra. Now as the voltage goes up, the current in the circuit goes up. As the resistance in the circuit goes up, the current goes down. All of this is explained by this equation and you can solve for any of the variables here using algebra and solve some really complicated circuits. All right, next let's talk about budgeting and finance. If you earn a set hourly wage, so many dollars per hour, and you want to figure out how much money you'll make in a week, you're going to be using a simple equation to calculate the answer. Or you can also turn it around and use algebra to back solve for how much money per hour you would need to earn in order to hit a savings goal. All right, next up is energy and work in physics. If you want to lift an object using a pulley, how much force do you actually need? Understanding energy conservation or momentum actually starts with solving these types of equations. In fact, momentum is the equation P equals mv, mass times velocity. So as you increase the mass, the momentum of the moving object goes up. And as you speed up, the momentum also goes up as well. This matches your common sense. Now let's move along to chemistry and chemical reactions. If you mix chemicals in a lab, you're going to often need to know how much of each substance to use for the reaction to work properly. This starts with a simple proportional equation, and you can use algebra to backward solve for how much of the final product you'll get from the reaction. For example, hydrogen reacts with oxygen to make water and a bunch of fire, but how much of it is made? It's also rocket fuel, and we use equations to figure out the answers. In structural engineering, if we design a bridge, engineers use equations like this to determine how much weight it can safely hold based on material strength. Moving into the kitchen, you might be cooking or following a recipe. If you're scaling the recipe up or scaling it down, you're going to need to adjust the amount of the ingredients. These are simple equations using algebra. Now back to physics and forces and motion, if you push a cart, how fast will it accelerate? The answer depends on mass and also how hard you're pushing with the force, and it's encapsulated in Newton's famous second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration. That's an equation that seems very simple, but it's powerful because we can solve a lot of problems, and you can use algebra to backward solve for the mass of the object or the acceleration of the object that's being pushed on with a force. In rocket science and space travel, before launching a spacecraft, engineers need to calculate how much fuel is actually needed to reach orbit based on the mass and the thrust of the rocket. And these equations also start with simple equations to solve. Now let's talk about waves for a second. If you hear a siren and you want to calculate how its pitch changes as it moves towards or away from you, you're dealing with the Doppler effect. And this starts with algebraic relationships. And if you move beyond sound into light with Einstein's theory of relativity, you use similar equations to solve for how the light changes in color as a moving source is moving around you. 
And finally, in fitness and health, if a personal trainer tells you how many calories you burn per mile when you're running and you have to hit a goal to burn 500 calories, you can set up an equation to find out how far you need to run. Really, the bottom line is that whether you're trying to calculate your paycheck or trying to design a skyscraper or launch a rocket or understand how the universe works at a fundamental level, algebra is actually everywhere. And solving equations is the absolute foundation for solving bigger problems, both in life and in advanced science and engineering. So what I would like to do now is actually roll up our sleeves and I'll show you how simple it is to solve equations and why understanding Understanding them is the key to unlocking so many real world and scientific applications. So we have to solve problems together and you'll then understand uh, by practicing what makes sense to do first. So for our first example, let's take a look at this equation. 3 times x plus 5 times x is equal to 16. Now x, the x that is here and the x that is here, it's a placeholder. It's a value that I don't know the answer to. I don't know what x is, but I know that in both positions, that value of x is the same number because the x that's written here and the x that's written here, once I know what x is, the same number exists in both places. So in the last lesson, you learned that, for instance, if this wasn't here, then since it's multiplied by 3, to get rid of it, you would divide by 3. And you learn that if this wasn't here, you would divide by 5 to get rid of the 5. But what do you do when you have them mixed together? Some students will first start by trying to divide by 3. But you see, when you divide uh, on an equation, you have to do it to both sides, and you have to do it to everything on one side. So if I try to divide by 3, I'll have to divide the entire thing. I'll put a big giant bar under this to divide by 3, and then the left side looks ugly and it's not simpler. If I tried to divide by 5 first, then of course I would do the same thing and divide by 5 and it would be ugly because I'd be dividing the whole thing. So neither one of those things makes sense. Now I want to stress to you that you could divide by anything you want, but it doesn't make sense to do it if it doesn't get you closer to the answer. And dividing by 3 or by 5 straight out of the gate doesn't get you any closer. But I tell you what does get you closer. These are like terms. I can add them together because these are like terms. The x's match and the exponents on the x match. 3 plus 5 is 8, so now I have 8x is 16. Now this is a simpler form of what I had before. So the general rule of thumb is you want to do things to the equation to get it simpler. Every step should get a little tiny bit simpler. Okay, and then over multiple steps you'll get to the answer. So this we know how to solve. Since it's 8 times x is 16, we will then divide by 8, but we have to do it to both sides. And when we divide by 8 here, the 8s will cancel. And so what I will be left with was x on the left and 16 divided by 8 is 2 on the right. So we figured out that the value of x is 2. This uh, equation is a little more difficult to solve in your head unless you start guessing random values for x because you have multiple positions. But if you put 2 in here and 2 in here, you have 6, 3 times 2 is 6, and 5 times 2 is 10. 6 plus 10 is 16. So you can again check your work as you always were able to in the past. So remember that if you don't know what to do to solve an equation, just do something that is legal that gets it a tiny bit simpler, and then you do that each step and you get to the answer. Let's take a look at example number 2. 2 times c plus the number 4 is equal to 10. What do we do? So a lot of students will look at this and say, well, I have a 2 in front. So that's multiplied. So to get rid of it, I'm going to divide by 2, and they'll start to divide by 2. But when you divide or multiply, you have to divide the whole left side by 2. That means a big bar goes under all of it. And that's going to look ugly. You have this 4 here, and the 4 is kind of like hanging off to the side. It's not going to get any simpler by dividing by 2. So when you don't quite know what to do, then look farthest away from the variable and try to undo that thing first. Think about this equation as a series of boxes, you know, those little boxes you can like, play games you know, with a presence, you know. You have an outside box and an inside box and an inside box and an inside box. And in the very center of the inside box will be my variable x. The only way to get to this thing is to start working from the outside, take the outside box away, then the next most outside box, and work my way until finally I reveal the, var the variable x. Here, this value of c is in an innermost box, and away from that, there's an outer box, which is the plus 4. So we need to get rid of this first and eliminate it and get closer to our variable. So we have 2c plus 4 equals 10. 
we know we can do whatever we want, we're gonna to choose to subtract four from both sides because that will make this go to zero. And all I will have left is two times C on the left and over here, six on the right. And this, you know how to solve. You see, we did one step and we arrived at something that now we know how to solve and there's no real question marks because we practiced it so much. Multiplying by two, I'm gonna undo that by dividing by two. The twos will cancel and what I will be left with is C is equal to three because six divided by two is three. And you can check your work, put three in here, two times three is six, plus four is 10, and that's the right answer. It's another example of a difficult equation to guess the answer to. I mean, you could get it. I'm, I'm not saying you can't get it. I'm just saying you're gonna have to try a few times to get the correct answer by guessing. And trust me, equations get a lot more complex than this. So we need to know the rules. Five times Z plus three, minus two times z uh, is equal to 15. Now, look at this and try to decide for yourself, what would you do first? Well, I could subtract three from both sides because I have a plus three, I could get rid of it. But the simplest thing to do is just to combine the like terms. Remember, you wanna, with each step, make the equation a little bit simpler. And the way to make it simpler that's the easiest thing to do is just to combine these terms with the z. So I have five minus two, there's a minus sign here, so that's three z, but I still have this plus three and then it's equal to 15. And now we have this equation. This equation is really of the same form that we just solved. You see, because it's something times a variable plus something. We wanna work from the outside in, get rid of this. So three Z plus three equals 15. We wanna get rid of the plus three by subtracting three. And what are we going to have? This will be zero. So three times Z equals, what is this, 12? And then we now want to divide, so I'll rewrite this. 3z equals 12. We want to divide because we're multiplying by three, so we'll divide by three. And what do we get? Once we cancel, the threes will cancel, and uh, we'll have z equals 12 divided by three is four. So the answer is four. And you can check your work by putting a four in here. It may be a little harder to keep track of, but five times four is 20, right? 20 plus three will be 23. So here we have 23, and then the two times four is eight, so then what's 23 minus eight? 23 minus eight actually is 15, so we know that that's the right answer. All right, here we go. Next problem, j over five plus three equals five. Now what do we do? We can't combine any like terms, we don't have any other like terms, but we wanna work as far away from the variable as possible, the outside present right here. We wanna get rid of this three. So j over five plus three equals five. How do we get rid of the three? Well, it's a positive three. We'll get rid of it by doing the opposite, subtracting three. And what will be left, this is zero. So we'll have j over five is equal to, what is five minus three? Two. So let's go over here and continue. We'll have j over five uh, is equal to two. And how do we get rid of uh, the five here? Because we want j by itself. We're gonna do the opposite and multiply by five. The fives will cancel because this is like five over one, right? All you're going to have left on the left-hand side is a single j, and then you have 10. Two times five is 10. Check our answer. We put 10 in here. 10 divided by five is two, and then this two plus three is five, so we know it's the right answer. All right. You really should never solve an equation and wonder if it's correct because you'll always be able to check it. All right, let's take a look at w over three. Minus six is negative one. We don't have any like terms, so we just look at the variable and go as far away as we can from it to get rid of this stuff. This is negative six, so we wanna get rid of that first. w over three minus six, negative one. How do we get rid of a negative six or a minus six here? We do it by adding six and we have to do it to both sides. So this gives you zero, and we're left with w over three is equal to negative one plus six, which is five. And I'm gonna rewrite this, w over three is equal to five. How do we get the w by itself? We're dividing by three, so we're gonna multiply by three. The threes are gonna cancel because it's on top and bottom. And what you will have left is just w equals 15. And double check your answer. Put 15 in here, divide by three, that's five and then five minus six is negative one. And so we know that's correct. All right, 
Notice that once you kind of get the hang of it, you just kind of know what to attack first. But if I tried to write a set of rules, I would never be able to write them in a easily understand, understandable way. You have to get it by doing it. So let's take a look at 11 is equal to six times h minus seven. All right, again, we have the h here. We want to go as far away as we can to get rid of this. So let's write this. How do we get rid of that minus seven? We get rid of it by adding seven and we do that to both sides. On the left-hand side, we're gonna get 18. And on the right-hand side, this gives us zero, so we have six times h. So we rewrite it, and I'm gonna flip it around here. Six h is equal to 18. How do we get rid of the six? This is multiplied, so we'll divide by six. The sixes will cancel. And what we are gonna have left is h equal to 18 divided by six is three. Double check, six times three is 18. 18 minus seven is indeed 11, so we know it's the right answer. All right, only two more problems. Take a look at 14 minus two x equals four. Again, what is farthest away from the variable I care about? This thing, I wanna get rid of this positive 14. Notice there's an invisible plus sign positive in here, so we wanna actually get rid of it by subtraction. So 14 uh, minus two x, equals four. Again, in front, the, the sign of the object is what's in front. It's a positive 14. We get rid of it by subtracting 14. And so we have to subtract 14 on the right-hand side. Now, 14 minus 14, zero. We still have the negative two X and four minus 14, that's negative 10. All right, so let's rewrite this. How do we get X by itself? We're multiplying by negative two. So we'll undo it by dividing by negative two. And so what are we going to have? Uh, the negative two will cancel, the, po the signs will also cancel, we'll only have an x left. 10 divided by two is five, negative divided by negative is positive, so x is equal to five. Let's check it, two times five is 10, 14 minus 10 is actually equal to four, so that is the right answer. Here's our very last problem, we have six times b plus nine, plus three times b minus one, and we'll get an answer of negative one. Now, we notice immediately we actually have like terms. We have the B terms are like, and we also have the numbers that are like. So if I wanted to, I could, for instance, add one to both sides and get rid of this. But then I would have to get rid of the nine by subtracting nine from both. I would have a lot of extra steps. It makes sense to combine everything you can first. So we're gonna simplify the left-hand side. The three B and the six B is nine B. The nine minus one is actually positive eight. And then we ha have this guy, and we know how to do this. We're gonna get rid of this uh, eight first. All right, like this. And because we're adding eight, we're gonna subtract eight from both sides. And so eight minus eight is zero, so we'll have nine times b equal negative one minus eight. That's negative nine. Now, how do we get the, the, the variable b off by itself? Since we're multiplying by nine, we'll divide by nine and the nines will then cancel. And so all I will have left is over here, we'll say B is equal to negative nine divided by positive nine is negative one, negative one. Now let's check our answer. If we put negative one in here, we'll have a negative six and negative six plus nine is a three. So we have a three up to this point. Now, if we put negative one in here, we'll get a negative three. So we have a three plus a, I'm sorry, a negative three. Uh, let's see here, I think, uh, yeah, uh, a positive three and a negative three, sorry about that. So we'll have, let's start over again. We have a negative six from here, uh, plus nine is a positive three. When we stick this in here, we're gonna get negative three. Positive three, negative three, add them together, we get zero. All I have left is negative one, which is what is the right-hand side, so we know it's correct. So here we've solved two-step equations. I think all of them require two steps, but some equations require more than two steps. But it's okay, once you know what you can do, what you should be able to do, uh, then you have to formulate a plan of attack. And you can't just write a list of rules. You have to identify and examine each individual equation. And you learn through practice. Just like when you play chess, or you play the violin, or you play anything, you have to practice. You see by example, you learn by doing, and instead of trying to memorize rules, you see what makes sense, okay? And I tried to point some of that out here. Practice all of these. You should get all of these answers correct. Follow me on to the next lesson. We'll get a little more practice with solving multiple step equations. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.